Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Nasir Dudati. Coming up within the next one hour. Crime and violent crime identified as the most pressing public safety concern in the country. We will be telling you why. Police CID concludes investigations into Charles Bissou, accused of corruption in the Anas Arimea Anas Expose. And also coming up later in business, Bulk Oil Storage and Transportation Company Limited bust to start automation of depots by the end of the year. And on the international front, India successfully launches second lunar mission a week after it halted the scheduled blast off due to technical snag. Thank you very much for staying with us. My name is Martin Isiedu Dati. Details of our stories now. We are starting from the front of the security because the police CID has concluded investigations into former secretary to the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining, Charles Cromwell Bissu, on corruption charges. The police CID conducted a probe into Tiger IPI's allegation against the former presidential staffer. Now, Charles Bissu was accused by Anas Arume Anas and his Tiger IPI team of circumventing the law to grant mining licenses to ORR Resources Enterprise to engage in small-scale mining while a ban on same was in force. Charles Bissu subsequently stepped aside as secretary to the committee to allow for investigations into the matter. The CID report said that the documentary which shows uh, Bissu taking money from uh, undercover reporters was not a true reflection of what transpired between BCU and the assigns of the said ORR resources enterprise. The report further stated that Anas Arume Anas failed to cooperate with the CID in the course of the investigation. The CID noted raw and unedited footage which was demanded from the journalist was also not submitted. But uh, initial reports we have gathered indicate that um, Anas Arume Anas has said and his team, that's the Tiger IPI, say that um, the raw unedited footage which was required or requested by the police CID has been handed over to the special prosecutor who is also investigating this matter. So it is just one side of the case that has been cleared according to the police CID. They have found no evidence against um, Charles Bissu. And uh, we go straight to the phone lines now and speak to um, lawyer for Charles Bissu, Yao Opong. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for your time. All right, so, uh, well, before we speak to him, he has actually spoken to us earlier and said that uh, he's in explaining the content of the leaked report. There are several investigations. The allegations made and other complaints made concerning Mr. BC in relation to mining in this country have not been confirmed and that he is a free person. He has not engaged in any of the acts that he had been accused or alleged to have engaged in. And in particular, we need to focus on the fact that it was, at least on the police report, the chairman of the interministerial committee who actually made the complaint to the police uh, okay. under whom the Mr. BC I understand was working. So the complaint by the chairman, what did he complain to the police CID to investigate? The public officer and defrauding by false pretense contrary to section 293 and 131 of the Criminal Other Offenses Act 1960. Did you have any of your team of lawyers with Mr. Bissu during the interrogation? Yes, but there are matters concerning lawyer-client relationship privileges that we are not permitted to disclose. But the point is that everything that the police found relevant is contained in the report. So I believe if you obtain a copy of the report, or since I believe it's a public document now, you may apply to the police and if they assess it and believe that it's a report that they can give you a copy, that is a decision for the police to take. So what happens to the case before before the special prosecutor. I'm not a lawyer in the case before the special prosecutor, so I cannot speak to it. All right, so this particular story is still unfolding. We'll keep an eye on it and keep you posted, especially uh, the part of it that has to do with what the special prosecutor also has to say, because two 
state institutions are investigating the same issue. Are they running parallel? We do not know yet. But the CID says they have concluded their investigations. They find Mr. Bisu uh, not uh, guilty or falling foul of any law. We are waiting to see what the special prosecutor will say on this. And NAS, we are told, would also be releasing a statement on this issue. Uh, we'll certainly keep you posted in our subsequent bulletins. Away from that, let's go to the Western region because factions loyal to the two feuding paramount chiefs of Discove cl um, clashed last night, throwing the entire twin town uh, into a serious chaos and uproar. There has been tension in the town within the past two months following a dispute uh, between the two chiefs over some boundaries within the two paramounties of the upper and lower Discove, with one village known as Turum being the, ma the major boundary under contention. The paramount chief of lower disc of Nanakwesi Ajiman is said to have been captured from his palace by thugs loyal to the chief of upper disc of to an unknown location. Terrified residents report of indiscriminate firing of dynamite causing damage to many properties in the twin community of Lower and Upper Discov. The operation, which started around 2 a.m. today, the 22nd of um, July, lasted for a little over 30 minutes. But the Lower, Manya, the lower Discov chief who was abducted, we are told, has been released. And... Um, Barkwesi Simpson, he's uh, with Connect FM, our sister station in the uh, Western region. He's joined us uh, on the phone. Now. He's also the morning show host of Connect FM. Good afternoon, Barkwesi, and thank you for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, you, you have been with the people of Discov and, you know, tried to get information regarding what transpired um, last night, getting into the dawn of uh, today. What have the community people been telling you? And if you can help us with some background. Yes, um, actually, um, what um, resulted in this chaos and tensions uh, emanating from um, a dispute over boundaries which have been dragging for some time now. Um, the upper disco chief claims he has a jurisdiction over a small community called Trum. Um, a claim he is actually been backing with um, a ruling by the Western Regional House of Chiefs and, and the Secondary High Court. But uh, the chief of a uh, lower disco, that is Nana Kwisi the ninth. We never agree to this. And so, um, this has been dragging on for some time now, um, resulting in this chaos that we had um, about um, 10 hours ago. And the chief who was abducted from Lower Disco, we are told that he's been um, found, the police found him, and that he's been sent back to his palace. Can you confirm this for us? Sorry? The chief who was abducted of Lower uh, Disco, mm -hmm. Where is he at the moment? Uh, well, yes, uh, it is true. Um, um, uh, about four persons together with the paramount chief of Lower East Coast, Nana Kwesi Ajiman, were adopted uh, by some tax believed to be loyalists of um, the upper East Coast paramount chief, that is, um, of him when he made the chief the uh, 14th. Um, I, I, I just spoke to one of the victims a while ago. Um, his name is um, A.J. Awache, a former assembly member of the area, and according to him, he had some um, unusual noise at dawn around 1 a.m. So he was rushing out to see what was actually happening when he bumped into these tasks. Uh, he claims that the tasks were about 50 in number, but almost all of them wearing masks. He was beaten mercilessly and taken to a living room of the upper disco chief, that is Nana Himadichi, where he realized four men, including Nana himself, that is the um, permanent chief of upper and lower disco, Nana Apisiyaki were, were, were in the room. Uh, the task left them. In the room till around 3 a.m., when the police SWAT team from the Western Regional Police Command came to rescue them and took them to the Ethiopian Quarter Regional Hospital, where they are currently receiving um, treatment. If the police SWAT team came in to rescue them, did they also make any arrests? The police, um, as I speak to you now, have not made any arrests, but then I can uh, confirm an authority that. Um, there is a heavy police presence in the community right now. That is a combined team of personnel from Second D and the Agunam Kazada, the district capital, um, are currently there fully armed and um, just ensuring that peace um, prevails in the community. All right, um, Parkwesi, thank you very much for this quick update. Parkwesi Simpson is the morning show host of Connect FM, which is um, a sister station of Media General. and. Uh,
given us an update that we would, we would certainly find out from the police what it is that they have uh, done regarding this and let you know in our subsequent bulletins. Away from that, though, the Inspector General of Police, that's the IGP, David Asante Pietu, and the Director General of the CID, uh, COP Mami Tiwa Adodankwa, will appear in court to respond to contempt charges against them over their refusal to comply with a bail order for Gregory Afoku. The contempt of court charge against the two police chiefs was scheduled to be heard on July 3, but also adjourned to today, the 22nd of July. The police administration refused to release Gregory Afoku on bail despite a high court order on March 20, directing that he should be released. David Asantepe, who is the IGP, and Mami Ya uh, Tiwa Adodankwa, who is the head of the um, CID, uh, blame, have been blamed for the police decision to set aside the court's directive to release Gregory Afoku, causing the suspect to spend more than 120 days on remand. The case was earlier adjourned because the respective uh, representatives of both the IGP and the CID boss had traveled out of the jurisdiction and hence could not be in court when they were expected to be there. Our man uh, is in court and uh, monitoring events there as well. Details would be coming out shortly. We'll keep you posted on that. And crime and violent crime has been identified as the most pressing public safety concern in the country. Details of this and more are captured in the latest Ghana Public Safety and Crime Report by the Bureau of Public Safety. Kwachia Freniyama has details in the following News Desk report. The report compiled by the Bureau of Public Safety says crime and violent crime continue to be a matter of concern as the two account for over 60% of all public safety events reported between April and June 2019. It says reported violent crime events increased by over 43% in the second quarter and accounts for more than 25% deaths over the first half of the year. The three most reported occurrences of violent crimes in the first half of the year are murder and manslaughter, armed robbery and assault cases. The Bureau of Public Safety also says the Ghana Police Service has no known active cold case program and absolutely no information on crime clearance rates especially for murder, armed robbery and assault. The Bureau urges the police service to depart from mounting regular checkpoints to basically check for vehicle documentations and occasionally for arms to irregular checkpoints and include sobriety checks. The report indicates further that transportation remains the leading cause of death among the 10 indicators of public safety and crime monitored. It accounts for over 41% of the deaths reported from January to June 2019. 65% of all vehicles involved in all road crashes are commercial vehicles, excluding motorbikes, the report adds. Finally, it indicates that the state's internal intelligence agency and the police intelligence unit have not demonstrated ability to develop and deploy a forward-looking intelligence estimate to deal with issues of violence and disturbances. Uh, so that's a report that has been released by the Bureau for Public Safety and um, Nanaya Akwada is the Executive Director of the Bureau of Public Safety and we want to interrogate this report a bit further. So we, uh, he's, been jo he's joined us on, 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 on Skype and Mr. Um, Akwada, good afternoon, thank you very much for joining us if you can hear me. Right, uh, clearly technology is playing some tricks on us here, but um, we would uh, do well to speak to Mr. Aquada on this latest report that has been released by his outfit, which indicate that crime and violent crime seem to be on the rise, and it is because of the, one, proliferation of arms in the system, and the fact that um, insecurity is in the country and is rising. Okay, uh, on to some other stories now. Um, 
An ongoing study by the Ghana Police Service on road traffic offences has revealed that private vehicles are more culpable in road indiscipline than commercial drivers. Out of a total of 210 offenders intercepted on some highways within a month, 164 were private vehicles. The special operation has further yielded nearly 200,000 Ghana cities in fines. The commercial vehicle offenders included two motorbikes, eight taxis, and 36 buses, bringing the total to 46. The private vehicles were 43 4x4s, 96 saloons, and 25 pickups and mini trucks. Their offenses ranged from driving on the shoulders of the road contrary to Regulation 106, subsection 18 of the Road Traffic Regulation 2012, LI 2180. Driving on the wrong side of the road, driving without license and the use of motor vehicle without roadworthy certificate as managed by Act 761 of 2018. Others were caught with the offense of using motor vehicle without insurance policy and misuse of siren and trade plates, as well as making illegal U-turn on the motorway. We have been collaborating with other agencies, National Road Safety Commission, DVLA, to enforce the law. This collaborative effort, which is barely a month now, is actually yielding positive results and it has become the game changer. In the sense that offenses committed are there and then detected, the offending drivers are arrested, offenses pointed out to them, and they are processed for court. In all, 120 vehicles were intercepted within the period under review. 190 of the 210 offending drivers were successfully prosecuted with six cases still pending trial. Two are on bench warrants, seven have been acquitted and discharged, whilst five offenders were cautioned and discharged. This operation has brought out very interesting facts. All along when we talk about traffic accidents, our focus is on commercial drivers, the truck truck and the taxi drivers. But from this operation, about 70% of the arrests we've made involves private car drivers, 4x4, four four, including even vehicles with GV number plates. What it tells us is that the causes of accidents on our roads may not only be commercial drivers, but people who think that because they are in these types of vehicles, they can get away with it, they are above the law, the police cannot stop them. A total of 100 and 37,480 Ghana cities in revenue has been accrued to the state through court fines. Director General of the Police Public Affairs Directorate, ACP David Senanu Eklu, reminded the public about some of the road traffic offenses that are often taken for granted. For example, people think that it is not an offense if I don't renew my roadworthy. I don't have to carry my driver's license. The road traffic regulations indicate that you should not drive on the shoulders of the road. If you are driving a car with a DV plate, the regulations say you must fix it in the front and back. You don't put it on the bonnet of the car and think that you are fixed. it. These are basic safety tips that I believe people should practice and follow so that we can have safe driving on the road, we can enjoy driving, and we can work within the law. ACP Eklu commended the role of the media in fighting crime, calling for more collaborations. All right, we commend the police for doing that. But I have a question. If you have a driver's license and it expires, does that mean you don't know how to drive anymore? Just food for thought. Anyway, Chairman of the Africa Cyber Security and Digital Rights Organization, Major General Francis Edu Amanfo, retired, has condemned the frequent shutdown of mass media in Africa. The former intelligence officer was speaking at the second civil society cyber security workshop in Accra. Records shows 21 internet shutdowns across Africa in 2018. The first three weeks of this year witnessed shutdown in five countries. 
According to analyst Robert Bestlin of risk assessment firm X Africa, the situation may be getting worse. Cameroon, Zimbabwe, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan and Gabon are the countries noted for shutting down the internet. These shutdown experts and rights groups say were politically motivated and a violation of the flow of information. Censorship in the African continent does not send the right signals for the future. Citizens' rights in cyberspace must be entrenched in cybersecurity strategies and a due process must be used in any shutdowns. Ghana recently shut down a number of radio stations in parts of the country, insisting they violated procedural mandates. Ghana's ambassador to Mali and the chairman of the Africa Cybersecurity and Digital Rights Organization, ACDRO, Major General Francis Edu Amafo retired, insisted such unilateral decisions were wrong. I mean, if it becomes necessary to shut down any radio station or any uh, cybersecurity outfit, Due processes must be pursued. Even when these are incorporated in the strategy, there is also the need to ensure continuous engagement between state actors and civil society organizations to ensure full implementation. The cybersecurity workshop focused on awareness creation among civil society groups. Given the virtual nature and interconnectedness of the cyber world, the security of the cyber world would require different approach from the approach in which uh, we approach our physical security. Other speakers want government to provide advanced technological platforms to enable the academia develop home ground solution to local problems. The workshop was on the theme, making our national cyber security policy and strategy citizen centric. In other news this afternoon, the overlord of Dagbang. Yana Muhammad, Ma, Ma, Yana Muhammad Abukar II has called for peace among feuding factions in Cheroponi in the northeast region. Yana Abukar Muhammad made the call when a delegation of the Gan North and West Council of Zongo Chiefs in Accra called on him at the Gbewa Palace in Yendi. After decades of conflict between the Abudus and Adanis, Yana Abukari Mahama II was outdoored in January as a new overlord of Dagbon. Yana Mahama Abukari II said it is imperative that the people of Dagbon restore the dignity of their revered kingdom to accelerate progress and development. The Dagbon overlord said he would work to provide the needed resources to bring rapid development to the people of Dagbon. The leader of delegation of Gan North and West Council of Zongo Chiefs in Accra, Alhaji Bukhari Hamidu, lauded the Yana for bringing peace to Dagbon. The delegation also visited and interacted with the wives of the Yana where they made a presentation to them. <laughs> Still on chieftaincy-related issues, let's go to the Ashanti region now because the Asantehene Utum Force 82 the second says the provision of sustainable quality education can only be achieved if stakeholders play their role effectively and efficiently. Speaking at the presentation of some educational materials to the Utum Four Charity Foundation, he observed teaching and learning is a shared responsibility which must be taken seriously. Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, in partnership with EPP Book Service, presented educational materials to the Otunfo Charity Foundation. 5,000 dictionaries worth 150,000 cities was presented to help promote the use of English language at the basic level. The Asantehine, Otunfo Osei Tutu II commended EPP Book Service for its continued support to the growth of education in the country. He explained the development of every country depends largely on education of its citizenry. <laughs> Brofuna etro no ya nenye. Zio. 
And they have a unit of the IABBA. Am I a bro for Cano Cressy? Brunica summons utensils, name verbs near the Indian assay. To we are paying this a Bessabo. General Manager of EPP Book Service, Millicent Brookman Emisa, noted that intervention will help improve basic education. This um, donation we have made to the Otum Four Foundation would support the children to improve upon their their language the vice chancellor of kwame Kroma university of science and technology professor kwesi obri danso said the institution has given out a parcel of land to epp to put up a bookshop on campus Let's take some other stories now. The first district level scholarship scheme has been launched in Sekendita Krade in the Western region as part of efforts to ensure free meritorious tertiary education in the country. Deputy Minister of Education in charge of basic and secondary education, Dr. Yao Osei Edutrum, says the district level scholarship will end in, uh, instances where brilliant but needy students drop out of school due to lack of funds. The objective of the district level scholarship scheme is to decentralize the scholarship awarding process with the aim of increasing transparency and accessibility to the available funding opportunities for deserving students. The scholarship secretariat will liaise with the regional coordinating council and the metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies to establish a district level scholarship review committee. Government, through the Scholarship Secretariat, has given 60,000 cities to each of the 254 district assemblies to award the scholarships. Municipal assemblies have been given 80,000 cities, while metropolitan assemblies have been given 100,000 cities. When we are asked the poor to struggle on the streets of this nation, and somehow believe that everything is going to be well with the nation, that is not how we ensure that this nation lives true to a motto of freedom and justice. Registrar of the Ghana Scholarship Secretariat, Kinsley Ajiman, said to ensure the awarding process is transparent, a committee comprising stakeholders with diverse backgrounds have been put together. By not last this year, we mean all accredited post secondary school institutions, both private and public. All the way from award, awarding of diploma institutions to PhDs. An initial amount of 30 million Ghana cities was not just approved, but has been released by the finance ministry for all this important national assignment. Uh, Vivo Energy has handed over two borehole facilities to the uh, Hiamachini community in the Ashanti region. The intervention, which follows an MTN video report aired on TV3, will enable the community to access potable drinking water for the first time. Yamanchini is a farming community in the Mampo municipality of the Ashanti region. The community has a population of 800, with about 60 cottages dotted around, mostly inhabited by Kusasi migrants from the northern region. Access to education and good drinking water are among the major challenges facing the community. This has been the only source of drinking water serving the entire population here until the intervention to provide two boreholes. Citizen journalist Naomi Ayambila first reported the plight of the community on MTN Video Report on March 25, 2019. Two months after, Vivo Energy responded to the community's plight. The company intervened by constructing two hand pump boreholes. Managing Director of Vivo Energy, Ben Hassan Watara, reiterated the company's commitment to support rural Ghana. He encouraged the community members to make good use of the water facilities. Vivo Energy Ghana was touched when a report on TV3 was aired highlighting the, the plight of this community in our staff CSR challenge. And as a company that is committed to socio-economic advancement of community, we cannot look away while 
innocent lives are exposed to waterborne diseases through unsafe drinking water. The chief of Yamanchini, Yaba Agurugu, commended Vivo for the gesture. We are extremely grateful for your support. God bless your organization. Mampo Municipal Chief Executive Thomas Apiakubi described the intervention by Vivo Energy as heartwarming. Vivo Energy also presented educational materials to school children in the Yamanchini community. Also touched by the needs of the community, individual staff of the company donated cash and building materials to support educational development in the area, especially in the construction of a dilapidated class 5 and 6 blocks of the Bengro Basic School. Two brilliant children of Yamanchini will also have their education sponsored by two staff of Vivo. So clearly media does get results. So do also let us have that video that you have of a problem in your community. If it is newsworthy, do send it to 055-143-044. 055-143-044. We'll be happy to read it to the rest of the world. This is Midday Live on TV3. Stay with us. Time for business. Now, the reduction of the benchmark values for import is yet to reflect on the prices of goods on the market. Three months after its implementation, importers affirm cost of clearing goods at the port has gone down, but traders say they expect the city to be stabilized to enable them reduce the price of goods. Josephine Frimpong has more. Benchmark delivery values of imports will be reduced by 50%. However, for vehicles, the reduction will be 30%. The port reform is expected to promote compliance, boost trade, and increase revenue. The Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, says the reduction has impacted positively on business. For now, I can actually say that um, we have general reduction between um, 15 percent to 25 percent depending on the item in question the news team followed up to the car ports to ascertain the situation yeah you brings bus sprint up ambulance because of baumia this can uh, you know their mind benchmark now if it are 34 560 instead of 40 400. i am a car dealer I recently cleared a Benz Bar Sprinter and the duty was 3,560 cities instead of 4,400 cities. I got a discount through the benchmark. I have also cleared a Kia Picanto and paid 7,761 Ghana cities instead of 9,000 cities previously. And you know, I'm going to but you say, no, today what is all right. I cleared some vehicles yesterday. Truly, it has reduced, but because of the dollar rate, nothing has changed. The reduction is super, but it hasn't addressed our major problem, especially with the rising city. We sometimes get buyers accusing us for not reducing the prices. At the central business district in Accra, some traders shared your views. I just cleared items for my ceramic shop and paid 8,000 CDs for a 20 footer container, which was a huge reduction. But the dollar is still high. The price in there. First, no duty, no, thirty three thousand Ghana cedis for government duty, no. We used to pay thirty three thousand cedis for used clothing for a twenty footer container, but now we are paying twenty six thousand cedis. I have now reduced the price of a bill of used clothing for children from thousand eight hundred cedis to thousand seven hundred cedis. Imported goods fall under the benchmark evaluation except exempted goods by government and other agencies. 
vehicle spare parts imports, however, do not attract the benchmark values, but dealers are pushing for it. Figures of cargo throughput between April and June recorded an increase. Statistics from the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority cargo traffic for April and May shows as follows. The Customs Technical Service Bureau of the Ghana Revenue Authority is responsible for giving out the values. A total of 600 Customs Clarification and Valuation Reports CCVRs are recorded daily, translating into 18,600 CCVRs in a month. But for Customs, it has currently resulted in revenue shortfalls. You do an impact analysis based on last year's figures and then this year's figures. If you are using uh, the, the fact that 50% and 30% on vehicles, 50% on goods, if you calculate the impact, it would, there's about a shortfall of about $3 billion. Now, if we are able to increase the volumes up to 60-70% increase efficiency in collection, we can compensate for that loss. The Finance Minister Ken Oforiata, in a recent interview at the Tema Port, affirmed its full impact is yet to be felt. Yeah, sort of an effect in the short term, but we are pretty confident that um, what we have done, um, the beginning of NPS, uh, which will be soon, uh, which will create you know, sort of the deepest breath, um, uh, literally between here and, and Cape Town, uh, we are going to see a change uh, in shipping lines um, sort of um, network, uh, which will lead to um, much more business here. Business and maritime analysts say we are reaping the full benefits of this reform because we are signs are showing that we are getting volumes of trade gradually in the second and third quarters of this year. Despite the positive impact of the reduction in the benchmark values. Stakeholders expect government to stabilize the CD to enable them achieve its full benefit. Justin Frimpon, TV3 News. The Bulk Oil Storage and Transportation Company Limited Bost has hinted the company will start the automation of its depot management by the end of the year to improve efficiency and eliminate losses. Head of Corporate Communications and External Affairs Malik Ajay noted that the depot management has to temporarily be outsourced during the period of the automation process. 2009 bulk oil distribution companies bdc's were allowed by boss to store their products in bus tanks across the country from 2009 to 2013 due to porous system inventory and controls at the depots bust lost 25.2 million liters of petrol and diesel amounting to 33 million dollars at that time as a measure against the losses to bust Former managing director of the company, Kinsley Kwame Uwada Akun, contracted TSL to manage the depots from 2014. Head of Corporate Communications and External Affairs, Malik Ejay, observed since TSL came into the system, Bost has not recorded any losses. We take the risk of product losses from ourselves as a company and laid it at the doorstep of TSL. The inclusion of TSL in the equation has resulted in some product gains and we think it is a good way to go. TSL's contract, which was to end in March, was extended to December this year to prevent any losses to bust. Malik Ajay hinted to avoid the human discretion and interference, which resulted in the losses which bust is still struggling to pay the BDCs. The company will start automation of the entire depot management system by end of the year and be completed within 16 to 20 months. Bost has advertised for depot management companies to apply for managing the depots from January 2020 until the computerization process is completed and the management reverted to Bost staff who are being trained. 
TSL was charging about $600,000 a month for the management of the depots. And when we pressed on, we got a negotiated amount of about 300000 which we still think is on the higher side. Going forward, when we successfully come to the end of the competitive bidding that we are instituting, we hope to beat the rates down further and to eliminate it completely after the automation. A research and policy analyst at Institute for Energy Security IES Megdad Mohammed gave the breakdown of bust losses from 2009 to 2013. About 74 million uh, Ghana cities worth of products were, were, were unaccounted for within the system. Uh, that is about 10 million in 2010, about 14.3 uh, million in 2011. In 2013 itself, about 45 million uh, worth of products were unaccounted for, which has been subjects of audits. He noted the bulk oil storage and transportation company limited has to go beyond the automation to ensure effective implementation. They must have the right people with the right mindset and skills to run the system. Lest we have an automated system which is managed by people who hate the automation because the automation makes it impossible for them to cheat the system. BOST since 1993 has been responsible for strategic storage of fuel and transportation of same across the country for efficiency and better running of the economy in terms of fuel requirements. And that's it for the bulletin. It came your way from our studio here at Adesa